So welcome everyone to the Women Writing History presentation. We're very excited for this event. We've been planning a lot for this and we have a full packed agenda for you. And we're gonna start off with a welcome from our president, Dr. Laura Douglas, and then we're gonna go into it. My name is Eva Brito, the director of the Women's Center. <laughs> I saw Laura, she is here. Okay, we ready to start, Eva? Yes, we are. <laughs> All right, well, it's so good to see everyone. Thanks for coming out on a, a, a afternoon at the end of the semester, a time when Maybe there's still a little bit of stress and anxiety, but it's so great to see your faces. And um, I wanna thank Eva for uh, putting this together and for all the other members of her team who have helped to make this project uh, such a living um, document. You know, I know that for myself, um, the leading through the pandemic has probably been the toughest time of my professional career. Uh, no PhD program or leadership training ever, ever really takes you through the steps of leading through um, a pandemic. And my greatest, my question to myself every day was, how do I keep this college community safe? And when we began preparing for the pandemic in January of 2020, people always say January, but the pandemic didn't really start until March but we were meeting, we were going into co the college on the weekends just to do additional planning for the pandemic. And I remember clearly thinking, people are going to die. And it was really difficult thinking about the truth at a time when we needed optimism and, our, and hope. Um, but our work was really addressing life and death in addition to running a college. Um, and of course, trying to do everything possible that we could to make sure that people stayed well. Um, and, you know, there were so many physical symptoms of stress. Um, I, I remember my heart racing for days uh, as we watched uh, COVID rates increase and we had so little information um, about this virus. It was a lot of difficulty about the unknown. So I always felt that there were two jobs for me during the pandemic. One was my regular job as college president, which takes a lot of time anyway, so more than a 40 hour a week job. And then the other job was learning everything possible about the virus so that we could take it head on and make the best choices to preserve the health um, and safety of our folks. For those of us who are college presidents, our work has really been in two places though throughout the pandemic. It has not just been about the coronavirus, it's also been about racism, equity, and social justice. And I can tell you that many college presidents have decided to call it quits through the pandemic. We've literally worked from morning to night every day for one and a half years. Uh, it has crystallized us it, uh, you know, in thinking what we love about college leadership, um, the hard work that has yet to be done, especially when we think about social justice and racism, and the level of accountability that is necessary in the job of leading an institution at a time of life and death. Um, and it has shown me that I uh, could have no greater honor than leading Bristol Community College um, during these times. Uh, and I mean that sincerely. Um, I, I sometimes wonder the way other people have led through, through the pandemic. And we, as we look at other colleges and universities, we certainly have not seen the outcomes that we've seen at Bristol Community College. We've had no transmissions on the college and on our campuses. And our first case was recorded on October 22nd uh, on our campus through our uh, surveillance testing. That means testing for asymptomatic cases of COVID-19. That was a fantastic run, something we were really proud of. And October 22nd is ingrained in my mind as the day that we had our first COVID case on campus. Wasn't transmitted to anyone else, 
but it was our first day. So I want you to know that I feel honored and privileged to be your president, uh, to have led during the pandemic. Um, someday I would like to write my own stories about uh, coronavirus and what it means to lead an institution. And of course, we're not through yet, uh, facing the summer with more face-to-face -face courses and also the fall. Uh, the story has not ended, the chapters are not complete. But what we do know and what I know personally is that we will continue to lead with safety and we will always look to provide the safest environment possible for learning and growth. So thank you for having me today and I look forward to hearing your stories. Thank you, President Douglas, and thank you for your leadership. We're honored to have you. And you've been, as well as everyone else in the college community, really created an environment where folks were able to feel safe and feel supported. So we appreciate that. So I'll go into our presentation today. I'm gonna to share my screen briefly. So give me one minute. So as I mentioned, we're here today for the Women Writing History Project, and we're really excited about this project to really highlight the experiences that women have had throughout the pandemic. And um, I want to make it really clear that this has not just been my initiative, but an initiative of a group of folks, faculty and staff here at the college that are highlighted here that really have come together and said that we need to make sure women's voices are heard during the pandemic. And we've met many times and we're really proud for what we have in store for you today. So why women specifically? Uh, this program actually started from the National Women's History Museum. They have a national project that highlights women's experience. And we decided that we wanted to have a Bristol version of that. So we put a call out to our faculty and staff and students to share their experiences. If they were women, what they felt and endured during the pandemic. And if they were not, maybe they could share something about their wife or their daughter or their sister, someone. Why? Because the pandemic has undoubtedly impacted everyone's life in many ways. And there's been many challenges and barriers as part of this, but women have disproportionately been impacted by the pandemic in many ways that I'll go into um, briefly. To begin with, you know, as um, women are close to 70% of the essential workers that have gone out every day and supported our communities. In addition, because of the world that we live in, um, most of the times women are the ones that have to take care of the domestic duties and taking care of the home and children. And when we think about childcare, being at home with your child and then trying to manage your work life or all the other duties that are, um, that was really challenging. Women had to become uh, teachers at the same time, trying to navigate our uh, children's schooling while trying to figure out what we were doing and all the anxiety that came with that and the mental health that went with that. As, and as you see there, there's some of the statistics that women on average spend a lot more time on childcare domestic duties compared to men. And women had to make choices very often. Do they have to go to work or do they have to take care of their child with the child's care? So it really highlighted the need for child care and to recognize how important it is in our world. And I also come from a place of privilege understanding that I was lucky enough to still have a job during the pandemic and health care and access to many things that many women that don't have in some of the social um, lower social economic classes and access to resources, just the ability to have a vehicle and have driver's license. There's um, advocacy and legislation going on if you're undocumented that you should be able to have a driver's license if you have a child that's sick and needs to go to the hospital what do you do in that situation if you can't drive especially in some rural areas that you don't have access to public transportation so there's many issues to consider and to consider that not everyone lives in a home where there's a healthy relationship there was a much increase in domestic violence and other sorts of um, abuse and that women really were left out and had to really 
deal with a lot of challenges. So I wanted to highlight this experience. There were some blessings that came with the pandemic, as we know too, it allowed us to really reflect on our meaningful relationships and build with our family. So it's two-sided. So we wanted to share these stories because we are living in unprecedented times and it is historic. So as part of this project, all the submissions that we got from faculty and staff are gonna be stored on our Bristol library and archived. So generations, our children, our grandchildren can say what happened during the pandemic and hear firsthand stories, the anecdotes of what students and faculty and staff experienced. So we're really excited about that. So this is just a, a small snippet of what you can have access to in our library as part of this presentation today. So we really want to share. And I know for me, it came with both. It came with its uh, challenges of really having a toddler at home and trying to do a meeting, put him on a Zoom and he, he didn't like it, I didn't like it. How do we make this work? And then also there was times that I could take a break during my lunch and read him a story and tuck him into bed that I would never do and really realize how much time we spent. So there was a little bit of both and we wanna highlight that. And there was a lot of loss that came with this pandemic. Folks lost a lot of individuals and the loss of the human connection, not being able to see your family members and give them that touch and feel that we so often wanted. And as President Douglas spoke to, there was two pandemics. There was the pandemic of COVID and there was a pandemic of the injustices, especially the racial injustices that exist within the United States, always existed, but were really highlighted. And folks had to deal with that in different ways and some um, ignited a social justice track and some really acknowledged what change they needed to do with them themselves so we can have a more just world. So there's a lot that we can um, speak to as part of this pandemic. I wanted to also share a video that I think speaks to this and highlights one of actually our, um, one of our Bristol's um, colleagues' wife. There really is no single story that can describe the coronavirus pandemic. You could say it's best told. It oh, I'm sorry. There really is no single story that can describe the coronavirus pandemic. You could say it's best told in the millions of individual experiences. Here's CBS's Chip Reed. I feel a quiet creeping insanity as I scroll from post to post. Christine Deng has kept a journal documenting her feelings during the pandemic, which took the life of her grandmother. Writing and journaling for me has always been a way to survive. Deng is one of 1,400 women participating in Women Writing History, a coronavirus journaling project for the National Women's History Museum in Alexandria, Virginia. Many share their frustrations, even anger. A doctor warns Mr. COVID to back off from one of her patients, but later that day writes, Mr. COVID, I just learned that you had no ears to listen and no heart. You just took her. One woman shared poignant photographs of life in isolation. Some turned their journals into works of art. Breast cancer survivor Diane Sanchez writes that her journal brings peace of mind. Grocery store worker Taylor Sampson cried tears of joy after getting vaccinated. And Lara Tenbarge says she felt empowered and capable after giving birth to baby Nora while wearing a mask. Women sharing their sorrows and joys in the age of COVID. Chip Reed, CBS News, Washington. What we've all experienced this past year. I like that baby's name. <laughs> So as part of today's presentation, we're gonna share some of those submissions that we just spoke about. And some of them are journal entries and we really wanted to highlight that too because that's a great mental health, you know, to just release what you're feeling through the expressive art of writing. And then some of them were drawings. Some, so we had a mixed bag of different submissions. And then, um, actually, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen that piece of it. So we're going to go into the submission piece. And then after the submission piece, we are going to have a breakout room in which you can share some of your own personal experience, even if you didn't submit, and really have some nice, meaningful conversations. So without further ado, we're going to go into the submission portion of it. And we're really excited that we have some performances as well. Some students within our theater department are going to perform, as well as some faculty and staff are going to read some of the submissions. They're all anonymous because we chose to really respect the privacy of our students, but we are going to share their stories and some images as well. 
So the first individual that I'm going to have share a submission is Nadine Montero, and she is one of our students here at Bristol that is working on a piece and is part of our theater department. So Nadine, you're welcome to start us off. All right, thank you. You know what I was thinking? Should we crucify the people who are able to find joy in the pandemic? Should they feel guilty for finding happiness at this time where we are supposed to feel sad and grief? I have a cousin, she lives in Japan and she's studying, we're both in the same situation and we're both away from our family. And I was just wondering like how she's dealing with this. The houses here are quite small, as you can see. Um, I ate in the same place. Um, I slept in the same place. I studied in the same place. I had meetings in the same place. I had my free time spent in the same place. And having my family, my entire family away and having many people from my family within the group of risk. You're always in anxiety trying to figure out in your mind, what would you do if something happens? If someone gets infected or seriously killed? But now I feel like I still have a little bit of this anxiety, but I guess I'm used to it because it's a year of the pandemic, um, but in the first three, four months, it was very hard to find that inner peace. And that's it. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you for sharing that. And that's part of a bigger piece I understand you're working on, correct? Yes. So that's um 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 that's the uh, my cousin's part. She's living in Japan, and uh, we're both in the same situa situation. And um, and I identify with whatever she's going through, like being away from our family. My family is in Cabo Verde, so 
And I understand that anxiety, she also talks about depression and being in the same, trapped in the same place. And the fact that the houses there are like very small, it makes it even harder. So yeah, I, I also interviewed my, my sister. She, she lives with my mom in Cabo Verde and she also, she is a mother and she also works um, as a flight attendant. So it was also hard for her to like balance both things, you know, she, she had like two jobs, you know, working as a flight attendant and being a mom. So it was hard for her. Um, I feel like everyone, some people did find a, a way to handle this pandemic. So they, you know, like shutting off the news and everything else so they can focus. Um, whatever they have and it's like, you know, we kind of feel, we kind of blame ourselves because, you know, we're supposed to feel sad and because many people are dying every day. And I also felt a little selfish, but I don't know. I just feel like we do whatever we can to survive. Absolutely. I think you bring up a great point that regardless of where you live and what language you speak and how much money you have in a bank account, that we're all able to experience this together and have that human connection that we all can go through this and connect in different ways. So that was one of the things we learned from the pandemic that we're more alike than different. So thank you, Nadine. Yeah. So next, uh, you're we're gonna have uh, David Ledoux from our theater partner. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I just want to uh, give a little retro re retroactive uh, context to Nadine's piece. Uh, it's a documentary theater piece. So she interviewed family, friends, me, people all around her, and we're going to be releasing this as a as a, a full a full piece. She's been working very hard this semester, and I couldn't be more proud of her. She's just really done some amazing work. So uh, this piece is from an anonymous student. Uh, and I will get started. To begin, my mother is one of the hardest working people I know in my life. She's held a job for the better half of three and a half decades and has never once complained about having to go to work each day. Working two jobs, she was primarily on the front line in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, even though she may not have been a doctor, nurse who helped patients during this time, she was the person that provided these patients with their meals to ensure that they had the proper meals delivered to them. Just from simple conversations with my mother, I can see how her work environment was completely turned upside down. From simple things like making sure to wash your hands after interacting with patients, to wearing a face mask, mask uh, or face shield, to social distancing in the workplace, the normal way of conducting a work environment was completely altered in a variety of ways. I do not think I could have handled the transition of going from a pre-COVID workplace to a COVID workplace because it put a lot of pressure on the individuals who were working these jobs to ensure that they properly followed protocols and that they were able to assist the public whenever they reopened. However, knowing my own mother, I believe that she handled the situation of COVID in the workplace really well since she, was support, since she supported most of the ideas that were put into place to ensure employee and patient safety. Also from conversations with my mother, I've seen how hard it was for her to be able to work on the front line throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. The uncertainty of a workplace being open or not and the transmission of COVID have been some major factors within a lot of places of work since people and staffers do not know what will happen next. With my mother working on the front lines, she experienced multiple COVID-19 outbreaks with her workplace which ultimately took the lives of some of the patient, patients that she knew. From her perspective, it was both scary and worrisome to know that this disease can break out at any point in time without any knowledge that someone was exposed to the virus. Luckily for my mother, she was one of the first groups of people to receive the vaccine. So there was little worry that has been taken off of her shoulders. I believe that even though COVID-19 has ravaged my mother's workplace, she's been resilient in regards to how she conducts herself in the workplace. 
and how she performs her daily tasks to ensure that all of the patients have been properly cared for. Even though my mother has been able to continue working both jobs, COVID-19 has ultimately affected our family as a whole. Early in 2020, my father, her husband, ultimately lost his life, which has left a big hole in my family. My father was a one of a kind person who did everything in his power to provide and love his family. It was hard on both of us to lose him since he always supported us in everything that we did. If my mother had a problem, she would always call him to talk to him and see what his opinion was on the situation. To me, my father was my biggest cheerleader due to the fact that he always supported me in whatever I wanted to do. Every day there feels like there's an empty void in our lives since he is not here anymore. Myself, my mother and our family have persevered through this tough time. However, it is difficult to grasp that he's no longer here. I also think of the memories that we have had with my dad, which always brings a smile to my face. We both feel fortunate enough that we were able to spend the time with him that we had since we had some of the best memories with him. Even though we have experienced some loss within our lives, it has not stopped my mother and I from spending time with our family, other family members. Throughout this pandemic, we made time to make sure that we were able to see our family members in ways that were safe for everyone involved. From just simple texts to using Zoom to going to each other's house, we were able to safely interact with one another without exposing each other to the risks, effects of COVID-19. My mother especially followed the COVID-19 guidelines due to the fact that her job required her to make sure that she did not travel and stayed away from people that may have been exposed to COVID-19. She never once complained about the guidelines that were put into place because she knew that if she followed them, it would give us the best chance at not catching the virus and not spreading the virus. I think that for my mother's sake and my own, it was imperative for us to ultimately spend time with our family through different means to ensure that we at least maintain some semblance of a normal social life. Thank you. Thank you, David. The reminder of the work of essential workers during this time. So next we have Gia Sanchez and she's gonna share a reading as well. You're on mute, Gia. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Eva. Back in March of 2020, a few short weeks before the world shut down, I was in school full time while working also part time. When I first heard of the coronavirus, I wasn't worried. We all believed it was just another common cold that would shortly go away. Fast forward to the middle of March 2020 and the whole world was being shut down for what we assumed two weeks. When I first heard that I started getting worried and wondered if I would be able to return to school as we left for spring break and I had no idea if we would be returning after. I also work at a daycare, so the daycare shut down as well. In all honesty, I wasn't mad about it because I got to relax from school for a couple of weeks and did not have to worry much. As the pandemic worsened and we knew we were not, we knew that we were just returning, not returning to school for quite some time, I knew that I would be stuck at home for months and months. My parents are essential workers, so I was at home with my brother for six months. In the beginning of the pandemic, I found new ways to stay busy while fitting in hours of homework. I began to stress a bit over school because professors were bombarding us with loads of work that we would not typically do in school. It was more of a busy work they were assigning to us. I started painting on campuses as a way to stay busy and calm. I've also struggled with anxiety through high school and beyond. And honestly, my anxiety was pretty low during the pandemic, which I know was not the case for everyone. When it was warm outside, I enjoyed sitting outside to soak up the fresh air and went on some walks here and there. This continued for about two months of the pandemic as I was still con concentrating on my schoolwork for hours a day. The pandemic started worsening and we knew at this point 
the world would not be opening up for a while. After I finished school, uh, of course, I, I of course was still out of work. I had all the time in the world to be lazy and carefree. I stopped going for walks and really found myself letting go in terms of not caring. I was every day for six months laying down, watching TV and eating basically whatever I wanted. My mental health was really okay and I was not anxious and felt more at peace during this pandemic, which at some points I felt guilty about because I knew so many people were struggling and losing loved ones. My biggest concern was my mother because she works in a hospital. So her saying safe was our biggest concern. No one in my household has yet gotten COVID, so we are very lucky. What we, what was really going downhill for myself was my physical health. I was eating whatever I wanted, not taking care of my body. I was gaining many pounds over the course of six months and did not feel my best physically at all. My sleep schedule was very messed up as I would go to bed in the early hours and not wake up until late afternoon. I honestly felt gross and knew I was gaining weight and becoming unhealthy. I could see it in my face in pictures, but chose not to do anything about it until September rolled around. When September came around, I was actually upset that classes were going to be online again and not in person because I enjoy learning from a teacher and not having to teach myself since our teachers did not teach us, but rather sent us assignments. I was offered a full-time nannying job while also working at daycare. Daycare reopened in July and since then, I have only worked at the daycare one day a week. Monday through Thursday since September, I am a full-time nanny. In September, I decided it was time to take care of myself and become healthy again. I started eating clean and exercising and still to this day, I have continued with it and plan to do so for a long time. I feel so much better now physically than I did during the worst parts of the pandemic. I did not blame myself because we went through a pandemic and I was home daily. I was never hard on myself because I like to live my life in the moment and not worry about much. I feel the more I worry, the more anxious and unhappy I become. Now I eat clean and try to go for walks daily while also working out in my home gym that I invested in. For me, mental health is incredibly important and my physical health is just as important to me. I always wonder to myself, if this pandemic ever happened, how different my life would be or if it would have, or if it would have ever put the junk food down and fixed my physical health. The pandemic has opened my eyes to see never take every day for granted and to make sure I am taking care of myself. I know I don't feel guilty when I say I benefited from this pandemic because it has helped me in more ways than I could imagine and I would not trade the six months I spent at home for anything. Thank you. Thank you Gia. I think we can all relate to the pounds. So we either gained some or lost some during this time. <laughs> so next we have another performance performance um, by two of our Bristol students, and they're both Rileys. So will the two Rileys um, can go next? <laughs> Hey. And again, just, uh, yeah, sorry, just to give a little context, this is, a, again, a larger piece uh, that we've been working on for the semester, and uh, we'll be releasing this in a couple of weeks. So uh, this is Riley Fortin and Riley Damaris. Hey. Um, yeah? I have to sell the house. Wait, what? I have to sell the house. Like our house. Why? I work at a smoothie shop. I just need you to sign the paper. I can't afford to live here on my own. Lucy, I did try to tell you. You can't afford it? Even with all the money mom gave you? Stacy only gave me $5,000. And it wasn't for me to keep. I was going to pay her back. Well, you really lucked out then, didn't you? Can you shut the fuck up? No, you're right. I don't have to pay her back. You know what I did have to do? I had to get out of the car on the side of the road and see her sitting there in the driver's seat. 
it didn't feel real. The whole driver's side of the car was just smashed in. And I kept shaking her. I kept shaking her through the window, but her head just hung down. And I, I screamed at the top of my lungs. I've never screamed like that before. Then I watched the paramedics pry her door off. The way they just took her out of the car, it made me sick. The next thing I remember is waking up in the hospital. I didn't even realize I was hurt. I didn't even realize. I kept waiting for somebody to come into the room and tell me what happened. I just laid there. And when the nurse told me that Stacy was in a coma, but I couldn't go see her, they were keeping people isolated because of COVID. I couldn't say goodbye. I had nothing. I've never felt like that before. She died the next day and I couldn't even say goodbye. She died all alone. And I keep replaying the moment before the accident. We were coming home from Plymouth. She asked me, what do you want to eat tonight? And that was it. That was it. What do you want to eat tonight? I keep hearing it in my head over and over. And the sound of shattering metal afterwards, I keep hearing it. And when I was leaving the hospital, there was this little girl. I was in the waiting room. I just sat in a chair and watched this girl. She was standing on her mom's feet as she walked around, just holding her hands and moving with her. She laughed so hard. And the first thing I thought about was that I would never feel that way again. I would never feel like her again. And I keep seeing it over and over. Losing Stacy was unimaginable. I thought I had nothing left because of you. I don't like when you call her that. What? Stacy. I don't like when you call her Stacy. Should I call her mom then? Or would that make you too jealous? Shut the fuck up. You need to stop acting like such a bitch. Fine, then I'll just go back to being stepped on. What? Never mind. Lucy, what are you talking about? Stop. Please stop. What? It's nothing. It's just. I need help, but no, I'll be fine. I'm just, I need help. With what? It's so bad. My roommates left and I've been all alone. For how long? I feel like I've been sad for a while on some level, but it didn't get really bad until last year. That's when I started drinking. I remember the exact night. Uh, do you remember that night on Christmas Eve when I just got back from school? When you didn't feel good, you know, so you stayed home and I went with mom to go to the store to get you some meds. Well, I was so excited to be alone with her because I thought that things would be different. I thought that she would ask me how everything was going, how my classes were, or tell me that you guys missed me while I was at school, but she didn't. She just talked about you the whole time, about how you got a full ride scholarship, and she thought it was just so funny that you turned it down, about how you're really gaining some success in your influence or career or whatever the hell you're doing, said that it's been okay with the two of you. She said that you guys were fine, but I wasn't fine. I was struggling to survive. I kept thinking to myself that maybe it would be better if I wasn't there. Maybe it would be easier. I don't know why I did it, but later on when you guys went to sleep, I just got drunk. It was the first time I felt okay in a long time. But then when I wasn't drinking, I hated myself. And it was okay for a while, like I could handle it, but then when everything started to shut down, when I was locked there, just alone with my thoughts, I started drinking every day. It's just been the 
days of everyone fucking hates me. And I hate you. I fucking hate you sometimes, Morgan. I don't know why, but I do. It's so much easier that way. It wouldn't be easier if you weren't here. And that's our scene. So thank you very much. Thank you for that powerful raw piece. That was beautiful. Thank you. Next on deck is Professor Engen at SA. Engen. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a submission that I've submitted. I just try to capture a moment from the life of my mother who lives alone in Turkey. She stares at the cold, still silence. It is another cold gray morning. She didn't sleep well. The lump on her jaw was bothering her all night. The doctor postponed her treatment because hospitals are over capacity with COVID patients and the risk of catching the virus is high. She wakes up to a lonely, chilly living room where she fell asleep on the couch, reading the same book she read last year or so. She is struck by her loneliness. The silence of her living room is disturbing. Her children now all grown up and they live far away. Her husband passed away 13 years ago. No soul in the house. Just pictures of family, furniture and memories. She can hear the neighbors as they head out to whatever they are trying to get to. She stares at the clock. She's a retired and doesn't have to worry about leaving the apartment, but deep inside, she still feels the anxiousness of the morning rush. She then remembers how tired she is of being locked up. And yet she feels lucky to be able to stay home. She has seen so much suffering in her life. The pandemic is just another one. She stares at the clock. Time feels irrelevant, turns the TV on just to generate noise, to break the silence and catch the news as she heads out to the kitchen to make some tea and sort out her medications. She stares at the TV. It is a bitter cold day. She considers turning up the heat, but she's worried the utility bill. Her thoughts drift as she sips her tea and lights up a cigarette. She exerts her thoughts in the blurry dust of nothingness as she tries to reclaim herself in the mundane everydayness of her existence. She stares at the TV. Every smoke she blows into her living room like a magical fog, bouncing around in daylight and the TV highlights the space, gives life to objects. Every smoky breath she exhales validates her body. She stares at the smoke. Her thoughts lost in the mist. She recalls a familiar feeling, a longing in every day dance and wiggle of her smoke. She almost remembers, and yet life seems distant. She lives in between her past and what it could be. Today is dictated by caution, fear, and virus, and tomorrow doesn't seem to come. Yesterday is too familiar. She stares at the smoke as it slowly vanishes like the familiar feeling. And that's it from me. Thank you, Angan, for that poetic piece. Thank you. Next is Colleen Avedikian. She'll read her submission as well. This is a student uh, presentation. While COVID-19 has struck everybody across the nation differently, this pandemic hit very close to home. My girlfriend graduated from the nursing program at UMass Dartmouth in 2019. Like many nurses, she started her career on the overnight shift and could not stand it. She hoped and pushed for a position during the day to open up. Luckily, after about six months, one had opened up, and this was right around the reality of COVID-19 was beginning to come out. Going from the overnight to the day shift is a tough process. From working with patients who are, for the most part, sleeping to being thrown into the ring and catering to sick every day is a big step. She was nervous, anxious, and hoping for the best leading up to her for a shift. But then the morning of the switch came, and she was actually excited to go to work. But the whispers of the virus were flowing out. No big changes had yet really come. On her first day, everything had changed. 
The country began announcing lockdowns and her unit announced that they were becoming the official COVID unit of the entire hospital. With so many questions unanswered, the conversations we had over the coming days were some really tough ones, debating on what our steps should be to ensure each other's health. Should we be sleeping in the same bed? Should I go back and live with my parents in hopes the virus would blow over? How much toilet paper do we have to buy? These were tough conversations. My girlfriend was there to keep us both calm as only she could. She let me know that as long as we took the proper precautions, everything should be fine. But over the next months, I saw how tired she was and how hard she was working and how frustrated she was getting. With all of the problems she was facing as a new nurse battling a virus that seemed to attack overnight, she was doing it all without complaint, coming home with a smile on her face and making sure I was calm and level-headed. From those initial conversations we had about the virus to now having made strides in diminishing the effects of COVID-19, she remained strong. From packing up extra hours at work, working at testing sites set up by her hospital, to being part of the team to administer some of the first vaccines. We have truly been blessed to maintain our good health along with our good spirits. And she had the honor of being one of the 76 healthcare workers who got to go to the Super Bowl in Tampa Bay, courtesy of Robert Kraft and the Patriots. With all of this good happening around us, the thing I'm truly thankful for is seeing how strong she is. I can only imagine some of the situations she's had to deal with and can imagine she conquered them all with grace. There are many reasons why I'm proud of her, but being a frontline COVID nurse is something I am not sure I will ever forget about her. Thank you, Colleen. Next, Elizabeth Betancourt. Hi. This is a piece by an anonymous student author. Not being able to see my friends was a big thing to me. Once they all started making plans to hang out again, I couldn't be a part of them because I couldn't put myself and my family at risk. I would always be the one to miss out on small group hangouts because I was super cautious of everything that was going on around me. I began to fall into depression. I didn't want to do anything anymore. I was so tired of hearing what was happening on the news. I just didn't want to hear it anymore. Later in the year, my father ended up getting COVID due to lack of sanitizing and social distance. My mom wanted to take care of my dad, but I did not let her go near where he was being isolated. For the first week, I was doing everything since I'm less likely to get COVID or have a bad reaction to it. My mom was sad and so was I. We were scared that he was getting worse and worse. Thankfully, we managed to get through and my father is better now. Somehow, I managed to get through and I'm here now. I'm back to work full time no Zoom meetings. I had a few COVID scares, but I managed to get through them as well. Even though things don't go the way we want, we have ways to fight through it and get through it all. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have now um, Robin Worthington. And this is another student, anonymous student submission. When COVID hit, I was in my second semester. I remember being so confused and concerned for everyone's health. Only one of my teachers believed that classes would turn to fully remote. So we explained to the class how online classes work. It was very helpful to everyone in that class because we all felt a little bit more prepared. I was an in-person student for a reason because I am a hands-on learner and I need a teacher teaching a lesson and helping me throughout the semester. This is why online learning was and still is so difficult for me. It is so easy to forget about assignments, miss Zoom calls and fall into a depressing and lazy mood. Occasionally the lockdown and the continuing of online classes have caused me to feel alone and almost out of touch from other people. When I first started at BCC, of course I was nervous, but I met some very nice people and made a few close friends. 
Luckily, I still keep in touch with one of my friends and we get together once a week to do some homework together. This helps both of us because it gets us moving and out of the house. We also get to socialize, which is good for the soul. Thankfully, I have my two dogs at home and every Wednesday, my mom teaches her second grade class from home. It's good, for, it's good to be home alone sometimes because it's quiet and easy to focus. However, being home alone can also push me to feel lonely and lazy because I have nobody to talk to or motivate me. To stay in good spirits during my quarantine, I focused on keeping my room clean, going for walks outside on warmer days, playing outside with the dogs and continuing to go to work for a few days a week. When COVID first began, working was very strange. I work at a cafe in Tiverton, Rhode Island, and for many weeks, work was extremely slow. We only had about 10 customers a day, which caused the manager to cut everyone's hours down. That made paying for school and my other bills a bit difficult. Had to be very careful with what I spent my money on because I had to keep in mind that my income was being cut. I have definitely followed the guidelines. I'm very safe whenever I go, wherever I go, and always wear my mask and distance myself from others. I have seen parties still happening through videos and posts on Snapchat and Instagram, and it makes me upset that others are acting as if this isn't happening. It is important that people understand how deadly and impactful this virus is, and that it is not a joke. I understand that there are a lot of unknowns occurring, but it is still upsetting to think that we had a whole year of following guidelines and being restricted to staying in our homes and now traveling far. Concerts, sporting events, parties, and graduations were canceled, which is something that nobody would ever expect to have happened. As a result of the coronavirus related shifts in my life, I have learned to appreciate the things we happen to take for granted like going out to eat, meeting others at places, seeing and hugging our grandparents, and going to proms and graduations. I have also learned that everyone is very strong. We are all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. Certain individuals have it harder than others due to medical conditions, their occupations, and family situations. From these coronavirus situations, we need to all learn to appreciate the little moments of life and never take anything for granted. Thank you, Robin. I will read the last one and I'm gonna share my screen for this one because this individual actually um, had some pictures. I do it that way so I can read it at the same time. April of 2021, I, I toyed with the idea of creating a journal or documenting during the pandemic, but honestly, the energy wasn't there once the day-to-day -day routine set in. I'm not sure at what point this pandemic officially started, but I think it was wedged in between hearing about Tom Hanks and his wife contracting COVID and the suspension of the N NBA season back in March of 2020. Leave it to sports and Tom Hanks to wake up America. <laughs> and then the other photo of March 2020, an awful, awful um, picture. This was the last normal family outing we had before school ended and our town shut down for what was then the unforeseeable future. It was just one of our normal little trips for ice cream that we always enjoyed in the warm weather. This day was one of those warm days. It was a Monday which at our local Newport Creamy is awful, awful day. At this point, we did not know that come Friday, March 13th, my son would be out of school for the remainder of the year. The stress and fear was not present. COVID-19 was not really on my radar at this moment. I was more concerned with what flavor I was going to order. April 20, 2020, the laptop picture photo. The world officially reached just over 1 million cases, just over 52,000 deaths. I'm not sure if this milestone was noted anywhere, but even at this stage, the seriousness could not be fathomed. July and August of 2020, the rock photo. 
Summer of 2020 was probably the most connected I have ever felt to my neighbors and family. It was filled with family camping, evening ocean adventures, impromptu parties with the neighbors, and a lot of laughter and memories. I was so proud of my children and my other children for all the creative ways they occupied themselves. They created various drive way stands and sold veggies out of my garden and stole crafts and sold crafts they created. They did so many things that I did, were idyllic to ch childhood. I only hope that my kids and my neighbors look back at the summer of 2020 with fond memories and not the fear and chaos of the pandemic. September of 2020, the picture of the girl on the laptop. There was a source of my internal conflicts. On one hand, I thought it was a careless notion to believe that children did not spread the virus and were not ready um, and were ready for the in-person learning. On the other hand, my daughter needed a committed experience outside of the house and for her education. I was at odds with my own beliefs and didn't know how to reconcile, re reconcile them. I felt like a hypocrite advocating for online learning while also hoping for my daughter to go full time. I still don't know what the right answer is. I don't think anyone does. Spring 2021, the photo of the grandmother. There is one thing I wholly resent about the pandemic, our ability to grieve for those we lost this year. I had a very close relationship with my grandmother most of my life. I watched her short and brief funeral on my computer in my kitchen while folding laundry. Silent tears streamed down my face while blurring my vision. I never felt so ideally alone at all my life in that moment. And that's the end of that piece. So those are all the submissions that we had. I wanna give a big thank you and shout out to everyone that shared. They were all powerful pieces. Yes, we can clap. <laughs> Great job, everyone. So we wanted to um, have a moment for us to not only hear these stories, but also to share as well. So we're gonna go into breakout rooms in a minute. And we've, I don't know about you, but I felt a lot of different emotions talking about people that we've lost and made me think of some things and then some of the good things that we also experienced in COVID. So we're going to ask you to go into breakout rooms and maybe share one word that came to mind in hearing the stories or something that you felt that resonated during this time. So it's really a chance to share what your experience has been and really connect because we need <laughs> connections right during this time. Um, and then that will be the end of our program. But again, thank you to everyone. The presentations were all great. The performances were all great. And this has been um, a collaborative effort and we're really grateful for it to highlight women and all the experiences that we've had during the pandemic. Looks like folks are all back now. I hope that you got a chance to connect with some folks and share about what this pandemic has been. Um, for you on a personal level and that you enjoyed all the conversations. Um, this pandemic has been many things as we heard. There's been times of joy and there's been times of grief and loss within this pandemic. But we're really proud of with this presentation is that we are capturing this point in history, this historic unprecedented time encapsulating it so it doesn't get lost. And more importantly, that women that have been heroic and have really been able to overcome multiple challenges um, have, um, their story hasn't been lost. And that's our goal here at the Women's Center to really be an advocate and share the stories of women. And this is an example of that. So again, thank you to all the committee members. Thank you for everyone that attended. And this is recorded, you can share it. We might, um, I heard from the theater department that this might be used to um, do a piece or a performance in the future. So there's a lot of where this can go. And make sure to follow us on the Facebook and on Instagram for Women's Center to find out more about all the things we do. And thank you for our wonderful event. <laughs>